Here's the Mullard Free Free circuit diagram which we have taken out of the book uh, which you see up here right now. We have this book for sale on eBay, the actual digital copy of this. Um, if you want to search for Vintage Audio Workshop, you'll see that up there. Also hit the website where you can fill in a membership form and take advantage of a free membership deal and get up there and keep going through this tutorial series. Here's the service technician taking you through the circuit diagram of the Mullard 33 valve amplifier. Right, the Mullard 3 valve 3 watt amplifier, which is much better known as the Mullard 33. For those of you familiar with it, you might think there's something wrong here because it's the wrong valves. You've got an EL84 as the output valve, not an EL33, and an EF86 on the input instead of an EF37 or EF37A or even in the F36 possibly. The reason is that there was more than one version of this. This used the more modern valves, but the circuit originates some years previous to that with the valves I've just mentioned. There are also two versions of this amplifier in another sense because they did it both as a power amplifier and as a complete amplifier. This is the complete amplifier down here. We have the bass control in the feedback and the treble control and volume control. In the power amp only, these were all emitted, the signal went straight into the input valve and you had an external mixer or preamplifier. So starting at the input, 500k log volume control, nothing to comment on there. As I mentioned in a number of other circuits, they're very similar. You've got a treble control here that works by having a capacitor at the earthy end, which short circuits the treble to ground, but has a high reactance at middle and base frequencies and therefore has no effect. So at this end of the control, it, there's very little treble and at that it's full treble. Coupling capacitor into the grid. Unusually, seeing it has got cathode bias, they've used 10 mega ohms. Now, I've mentioned this in connection with some other circuits. Um, it's grid biased by some of the electrons hitting the control grid and turning it negative. You have to have a high value resistor here, otherwise it doesn't work, but that biases it. But unfortunately, a byproduct of that is increased distortion and reduced gain. So I'm very surprised they did it. It's normally done for cheapness so that you can emit the cathode resistor and normally a bypass capacitor. There isn't one here because there's negative feedback applied there. So it's pentode connected, but not as you'd expect it. The screen grid is fed from the cathode of the output valve. That resistor looks rather high for an EL84, so we've got rather more volts on the cathode than you would normally expect. Massive decoupling with a 25 microfarad for the screen grid, so that's very clean DC. The anode of the EF86 is connected via a 1K grid stopper to the control grid of the EL84. Now clearly that is going to be considerably positive with respect to ground but the high bias voltage on the cathode means that it is still negative with respect to the cathode. A mega ohm in the anode load is very high. Because there is no grid leak on this valve, um, they can get away with that. Otherwise, they'd have to have a grid leak of a minimum of three mega ohms to be three times the anode load, and preferably five mega ohms, which would be excessive when used with an output valve. Very little volts there. It's a shame that they don't mark the voltages on the circuit diagram, but look at the value of the coupling capacity. You'd have thought that was going to be the anode load at 390K. It's about 10 times what one would might expect in a normal circuit. Because of that, the decoupling capacitor that you'd expect to be a few microfarads and an electrolytic need only be a 0.25 microfarad. And in those days, certainly, they didn't make those in electrolytics. Um, there are some miniature electrolytics nowadays for use in things like mobile phones, where they use electrolytics for very small values, simply because they want them to be as small as possible. We then have a very small screen resistor. There is a decoupling a resistor 
more typical value, 3.9K, big capacitor. Basically, because this doesn't have good smoothing, um, it's got 50 microfarads, but there's no smoothing resistor before the anode, so they have to do the smoothing there so that ripple doesn't go to the output valve's screen grid and on to the input stage. For some reason, they've got a 1K across there. I think that's a safety resistor for when people forget to plug their speaker in. Now, 1K compared to the resistance of a speaker likely to be used with it is very high indeed. After all, it's unlikely to be used with more than a 16 ohm speaker. However, that 1K is probably enough if you forget to connect the speaker and turn the thing up loud to stop enough volts being um, developed across the primary to either destroy the transformer's insulation or to destroy the valve's insulation or to flash over across the valve base, which is what happens with single-ended output stages. Can happen in push-pull. That said, because there is negative feedback, you probably wouldn't get that excessive voltage anyway, but it's not a bad idea to try suppressing it anyway. So what have they done with the feedback here? So we have a fixed resistor that we'll consider first of 6.8K. It's quite often the case that one has to have a capacitor across it for stability purposes. Now, R4 varies with the output impedance. At the low impedance of 3.75 ohms, the ratio of the output transformer is highest Therefore, the voltage on the secondary is lowest. Therefore, the same amount of feedback, the resistor in the cathode has to be the highest value. When we go to seven and a half ohms, the output voltage has increased and increases more when we get to 15. So in each case, we reduce the value of R4. Now this part here is the base control. If we turn it to this end, we short circuit the resistor and we also short circuit the capacitor so it has no effect. But as we turn it this way, the base frequencies have reduced negative feedback because of the higher series resistor up to 50K. But the point one looks increasingly like a short circuit to treble and mid-range frequencies and therefore the feedback ratio remains constant with the adjustment of this control. So this is um, the base and that was the treble. I attached on the power supply you have a decoupling resistor and the 60 microfarad capacitor. Now again we have asterisks. They offer you three alternatives for the input. There is a two valve preamp, a three valve preamp and a mixer. They draw a different amount of current and therefore the resistor here is chosen to give the correct HT voltage for those input units um, regarding their varying current requirement. Here we just have a very conventional power supply. There is a limiting resistor in the cathode. It's another one that has in this case a hash. It says depends on the mains transformer. Um, they made this fairly flexible so that the amateur who constructed this was not constrained to using one specific mains transformer. If you had a lower voltage, say a 275 or a 250 volts, one would reduce that resistor considerably. On the other hand, if you used a 350 or 350, it would need to be higher than would be used with the 300 volt. Um, somewhere in the text, they will tell you what those resistor values should be. Apart from that, all there is to comment on is that there is a separate winding for the EZ80 rectifier. The EZ80 is actually rated with enough cathode to heater insulation that you don't have to have a separate heater winding, but it is still better practice not to risk the insulation and to have that winding. They have center tapped the heater winding for these valves and also for the external um, preamplifier 
to reduce the induction of hum. So they haven't earthed one side of it, they have simply centre tapped it, which is the better way. And of course one should use twisted pair for the heater wiring all the way through, but especially um, to this stage and into the preamp. They are showing um, a double pole main switch. They're not showing an earth connection. They are showing a fuse, although frankly, one amp for an amplifier this small, even if you build the stereo version of this, that is still excessive. I would have thought a quarter of an amp time delay is more than adequate not to give you nuisance fusing, but to give you significant protection. So if there's a short on the HT line, it doesn't burn out the mains transformer first and the fuse later. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook and Twitter accounts. So far to date we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment, starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players. We have also covered the Mullard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers, the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70 and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.